Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. I'm Don. I'm an alcoholic. I'd like to thank my good friend Zeke for that somewhat adequate introduction. And uh, before I get too wrapped up in uh, talking about Step 12 and sponsorship, I'd be remiss if I didn't take a moment and thank the other speakers that have presented this weekend. You've had seven presentations so far. And in my opinion, uh, you'd have to look far and wide, high and low, to, to find seven presentations of the caliber that we were all honored and privileged to hear this weekend. And something I, I want you to keep in mind as I start to speak this morning is uh, seven out of eight ain't bad. <laughs> and I really enjoy being in a format like this where I'm the last dog in the yard, right? And I've already heard all these great talks because all the pressure's off. Right? I can suck. <laughs> Nobody can. You can't complain about that. What are you going to complain? I mean, you can go home and go, wow, how was the conference? You know, oh, it was unbelievable. First seven speakers, out of the park. Eighth guy, eh, not so much. <laughs> no one's going to feel sorry for you. So, so thank you to the other speakers. You know, I have a sobriety date, September 16th, 1991. I just turned 31 years sober, and I'm very grateful for that. Thank you. We all know you're applauding for Alcoholics Anonymous, and as you hear my story unravel and some of my experiences, you'll know I've had little to do with the blessings that are in my life today. You know, I'm living the best life I've ever known, surrounded by the best people I've ever known, and I am overpaid, and I hope that I never lose track of that, that this is a gift. But as a good friend of mine used to say, when you come to Alcoholics Anonymous, they give you this gift, but it's a gift that comes unassembled. And I've been fortunate enough to be with the masters of Alcoholics Anonymous, people that knew how to put this gift together, that has taken the time, the patience, the tolerance, the love that's required to put the gift together for an alcoholic of my type. So I can't take any credit for the good life I have, but I will receive it, and I will enjoy it. And I know that real gratitude is based on that kind of awareness. And at 31 years sober, you know, gratitude is the foundation of my daily living. I don't want to lose sight that I'm in the middle of a miracle and it's right in my life. And I love when Candace says you open the refrigerator and you look in and you just smile. I get that. I do that on my daily basis. Because when I came to AA, feeling a little bit less than, the first thing I notice is AA is full of show-offs. You know, and uh, <laughs> God, I'm at the low point of my existence and everywhere I look, somebody's showing off. I mean, you guys had things that I could never imagine having, like a, a valid driver's license, you know, and uh, <laughs> And there's an address on the license, and if you go there, you live there. Now, that's showing off. I mean, that's an over-demonstration of spirituality, in my opinion. And uh, I have no clear-cut explanation for how I ended up in Alcoholics Anonymous. I, I want to blame somebody. I mean, I, I had a story when I got here, and it's a story of victimization, but, you know, then you get a sponsor, and ah. Uh, Listen, if you're an alcoholic and a victim, that's your business. I have no opinion on that or judgment of that. But if you want to remain a victim here in Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm going to give you a little free advice. Whatever you do, above all else, don't get a sponsor. Because they seem to delight in destroying victimization. There's a propulsion system for untreated alcoholism described in the big book. And it says, I'm driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity. Any one of those things can kill me. You put them together, it's a deadly cocktail. But in Alcoholics Anonymous, we won't tolerate self-pity. And some people might not understand that when they see him for sponsorship, when they see the transparency demanded for recovery, when they see us hold each other accountable and sometimes the spiritual peer pressure that's here, it might be misinterpreted. It might be looked at as a lack of compassion, and nothing could be further from the truth. The most compassionate people I've ever met in my life I've met in Alcoholics Anonymous. 
What it is is we know self-pity kills drunks. Pour me, pour me, pour me another drink. And I got to tell you, man, sponsorship destroyed my self-pity. Because all my life I've been able to tell you a sad story. My mom's alcoholism, the physical abuse. I never knew my dad. He got up at two years old, said he's going out for a pack of smokes, and I haven't seen him since. Tough neighborhood, never had a guy to show me how to grow up and do things. You see how it just rolls off the tongue? There's a reason for that. It's practice by the time I get here. I've been telling that story of victimization so hard and so long that my perception is my reality, and my reality is my truth. You can't move me off of that point. It's not my fault. Walk a mile in my shoes. Maybe you should do that before you judge me. Maybe you would drink the way I drank. And the problem with being a victim in Alcoholics Anonymous or out there actively destroying myself with beverage alcohol is every drink I take, I take with impunity because it's really not my fault. Let me explain. And I'm good at explaining. Everybody knows, how do, you be- how do you tell a good lie? You've got to believe it first. You've got to commit to the lie. And I was committed. And then I got a sponsor. And he took me kicking and screaming through the steps. And he got down in the inventory process, what really happened, in black and white. And it was astounding, the things I forgot on my way to Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I had a mother that three- raised three kids on her own in a tough neighborhood, Never took a dime of welfare. Got up in the morning, got us dressed, got us fed, got us to school, took two buses to work, two buses home to pick us up, to do homework, to feed us, to clean us, to put us in a safe apartment to get up. And her reward is she got to get up the next day and do it again. Now, this woman that I just described to you that should be classified at no less than a saint, when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I was filled with rage and spite and venom for that woman. That's a lack of perception. That's a delusion. And thank God that the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous and the inventory process in particular corrected the only mistake a loving God ever made in my case. And that's made, he made my eyes looking outward instead of inward. And I'll give you an example of how sponsored it does that. I get sober in Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm 80 grand in debt to the IRS. Which, you know, I've, I've done the math. I've looked it up. That's like 167,822 current dollars. I kind of look that up every now and then. And that's not a big deal. You got a half a million in the bank. Write the check. But if you're unemployed and you haven't worked in a year by the time you come to AA and then your sponsor gets you a job as a laborer on a framing crew, you never work with your hands and you suck at that job, you have a nickname on the job site, the bleeder. <laughs> and you're making minimum wage with taxes taken out, 80 grand's a big deal. And I was so full of self-pity on that. And my sponsor, man, he didn't tap me on the head and go, there, there, little alcoholic, you're home. It's all going to be okay through the amends process. God sees your effort. And it's going to, you know, you know what he said? He goes, man, that's a lot of money. <laughs> he goes, you may never get out of debt. But you'll be sober, (laughs) because then they laugh. (laughs) They laugh at our misfortune until we learn the joke, and the joke is us. But I'll tell you what, whatever you got, whatever you got, when you get here, bring it to Alcoholics Anonymous. The members of Alcoholics Anonymous will take what you bring, and they'll turn it into service. Oh, my God, my sponsor took that little nugget of information for the next five years. If any newcomer had the audacity to complain about his little $1,500 IRS debt, this would be my sponsor. Oh, hold that thought, Jimmy. Hey, Don, you got a minute? (laughs) And I'd walk over innocently, and he'd go, Don, tell Jimmy how much you owe the IRS. And I'd look at Jimmy, i go, I owe the IRS $80,000. And Jimmy would go, Jesus! And my sponsor would laugh, and Jimmy would feel better, and I'd go, just want to be a service. <laughs> I learned to laugh at my misfortune in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. In fact, to this day, one of the top three barometers of my spiritual condition that I use is how's my sense of humor about myself? Now, I got a great sense of humor about you, because you are hilarious, right? 
I love poking fun at other people's expense, all that character defect stuff. How am I laughing at myself? How am I when I'm the butt of the joke? How am I when I do something embarrassing that is worthy of laughter and people laugh? How do I feel about that? Tells me a lot about my spiritual condition with my own sense of humor about myself, about my humanity, about my perfect imperfection. And I learned that in Alcoholics Anonymous. Stop trying to be perfect. You're never going to get there. The highest rank you ever hit is what? Human. Which means we're going to make mistakes. We're going to be sloppy. We're going to make fools out of ourselves. And I'll tell you what, if you take yourself too seriously, you're not going to make it. And the worst part about that is you're going to miss the joke. It's, you're going to miss the joke because it's hilarious. I mean, I can't tell you on a weekly basis, I'm just driving down the road, I'm going to an appointment, I'm minding my own business, and I'm thinking, I'm just thinking. I don't know about your thinking. Doesn't it feel, I don't know, magnificent in the warm confines of your head, right? And And then I'll think about what I'm thinking, and it'll scare me. And I'm like, where did that come from? I should write GSO a postcard. This is what I thought about today, 31 years sober. Oh, my God. And I'm here to talk about the 12th step, man. Having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, I tried to carry this message to the alcoholic and practice these principles in all my affairs. And it sounds, it sounds confusing when you're new, when you're trying to work the steps off the lampshade or the window shades on the wall, but it's not. It means what it says. And it seems inadequate. Your sponsor goes, we're going to work these steps. What do I get? Do I get a hot chick, nice car, lots of money? What do I get? We don't know. Maybe, maybe not. But we know what for sure you're going to get. You're going to get a spiritual awakening. And? No, that's it. And it feels inadequate. Doesn't it? It's like, tell me there's more to this than that. Why would I recognize the value of a spiritual awakening? I come off the streets, I'm a, I'm a run and gun kind of guy. I lie when the truth will serve me better. I have no, you know, I used to think I had no principles. My sponsor said, oh no. He goes, look up principle. And principle says law of conduct. Just how I act. He goes, oh, you've always lived by principles, Don. It's the principles you've chosen to live by that have put you in the state that you're in. Get the other guy before he gets you. Never tell the truth. Don't let him know what's going on with you. On and on and on. The list of principles I operate under. I arrive at Alcoholics Anonymous with a satchel full of character defects and a bushel full of delusions. You know, we talk about delusion and self-delusion in Alcoholics Anonymous, and both of those are going to kill me if I don't find out what they are and don't have those dispelled, right? Because a delusion is just a false psychotic belief, means that there's all kinds of things in the world that I think are true that just aren't true. But that's not the dangerous one. The dangerous one is the self-delusion. That means there's stuff about myself that I'll pass a lie detector, I'll put my hand on the Bible and swear, I think it's true about myself that just isn't true. And you know what's crazier about it? I'm the only one that thinks it's true about me. My family doesn't think it's true about me. Society doesn't think it's true. My girlfriend doesn't think it's true. My employer doesn't think. Here's my biggest self-delusion, the one that's going to kill me when I come to Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm a wonderful guy. (laughs) I just drink too much. I am sure that the things I did when I was under the influence of whiskey would be impossible in a sober state. Oh, I'm quick to admit I'm a liar, a cheat, and a thief under the influence, but let's all agree those things are impossible now that I'm sober and Alcoholics Anonymous. (laughs) And that's my self-delusion until I continue to lie, cheat, and steal in Alcoholics Anonymous. My favorite example of that, I go and I'm working construction. I bleed every day. I'm an undisciplined newcomer. I have no money. I've got to get up in the morning to make my lunch or I go hungry because i got no money. Right? And I get up at 4.30 in the morning. I'm living at my sister's house because when the going gets tough, the tough go home. And I'm going out, same, same route every day, right? Through the laundry room, into the garage, out the man door, down the hill about a half an hour where a guy was kind enough to pick me up for work every day. 
And one day I get up late, I'm undisciplined, I guess I'm not eating that day, I don't have time to make lunch, I'm blowing through the door, sitting on the washing machine is my sister's purse, I'm 45 days sober. And I think to myself, why does she do that? Why does she tempt me? And boom, you got the angel and devil on your shoulders. Don't do it, don't do it, just leave. And you know, the devil's like, just look, man, whoever, you know, it's just a look. And I'm like going, and I look, man, and I get the wallet, and there's all this cash, and the angel's screaming out, don't do it, you're in AA, you're sober, you have a sponsor, you have a home group. You... The devil's like, shut up, <laughs> you know. <laughs> You'll pay it back, she'll never miss it. She has lots of money, you don't have anything. And I take 20 bucks, man, and I knew it was the wrong thing to do. My God, I'm going to two meetings a night. I'm 45 days sober. I'm already in the steps. Didn't apply any breaks, right? And I felt terrible, but I spent it. Hell, a couple of bucks even made it in the seven tradition. You know what I mean? <laughs> and it's like a week till pay. It's like a week till payday, man, and that was the longest week of my life. And I'm just counting the days so I get paid so I can slide that money back in her wallet. And I got paid, and I got that 20 bucks cash, man. When nobody's looking, I slide that 20 bucks back in her wallet. And I go, whew, I don't know much, but I know I'll never do that again. And I didn't. I didn't any more than six or seven times. And uh... And you fast forward a couple of months, and I'm undisciplined, and I don't make lunch one day, and I look at my sister's purse, and I think, I can't do it, and I don't know why, but I can't do it. And I guess I'd been to enough meetings, I'd gone deep enough in the steps, I'd prayed enough times on my knees to a God I didn't yet believe in. I don't know what one of those actions or an alchemy of a combination of them led me to a decision that I'd rather be hungry than steal. And I don't know how that happened. Of course, you fast forward, and now I'm in the amends process, and i got to sit in front of my sister and tell her all the stuff she already knows about, stealing her car, stealing her money, missing the birthdays, being an absentee craphead brother. You know, i gotta, I got to tell her about everything I did, which most of what she already knows about. i got to ask her how that affected her. i got to ask her what I can do to make it right. i got to be willing to take that under advice with my sponsor and try to clean up the wreckage that is accumulated by a life of living on self-will. That's all great in the amends process. But then i got to tell her this thing, and I go, i got to tell you something. And I don't think you know about it. And this is going to be really hard, and I don't know how it's going to affect you. And she goes, what is it? I go, I stole from you. She goes, oh, Donald, you've been stealing from me for years. And I, <laughs> and I go, oh, no, this is Sober and Alcoholics Anonymous recently. She goes, what are you talking about? i got to tell her story. I go, well, some days I'd be late, and I didn't make my lunch, and I'd, I'd steal 20 bucks from you. And then on payday, I'd slide it back in. And I must have done that six or seven times. And I, I have no excuse. I'm going to AA. I was stone cold sober when I was doing it. I can't blame the whiskey. And I don't know what I can do to make that right or how that affects you. And I know she's going to put me on blast. And this is what she says. Oh, thank God you're telling me. I thought I was losing my mind. <laughs> I go in my wallet. I know I got 60 bucks. I got 40 bucks. I go in my wallet. I know I got 30 bucks. I got 50 bucks. I thought I... <laughs> I thought I was going crazy. Thank you so much for telling me. Just want to be a service, you know. I found out through inventory I was raised in a family of love with morals and principles. I was surrounded by men that took an interest in me. Although I had a father, I had surrogate fathers. I had athletic coaches and teachers that somehow saw potential in me and tried to develop that. When I graduated high school, I had a 3.6 GPA. I was our graduating class athlete, and I had 40 scholarship offers to play basketball that I never opened the first envelope to. Fear. The fabric of my existence is shot through with it. We think fear ought to be classed with stealing. And we class it with stealing because it steals our dreams, it steals our ambition, it tells us don't look that way, it tells us we're not good enough. The two basic human fears, one, I'm not enough, and two, I won't be loved, and I'm full of it by the time I come to Alcoholics Anonymous. 
I have no reason to explain why I tore my life apart with alcohol other than I got drunk for the first time at 17 years old. And we, my getting drunk for the first time sounds like your getting drunk story. All our getting drunk for the first time stories sound the same. Some variation on a the theme, right? I got drunk for the first time when I was 17. I felt 10 feet tall. I felt better looking. I had confidence. I wasn't afraid. I could ask that pretty girl to dance. You know, on, some variation on a the theme, right? But we all tell it like it's delusion or fantasy. I'm not sure. The Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous clearly states every man and woman is blessed with certain skills, aptitudes, and abilities. We'll call these our gifts from God. These are the things we're naturally good at. We didn't have to work at them, and everybody gets a different set of gifts, right? Some people can sing. Some people are better looking than others. Some people are more athletically inclined. Some people can do math. I don't know why, but we all have things that we know. Those are the things I'm naturally good at. What if these gifts, your birthright from your Creator, always felt that they were, I don't know, just outside of your grasp. Where you suspected they were there, you could occasionally make contact with them, but you couldn't do it with a consistency that made you feel that you own them. Something in AA we like to refer to as what? Potential. (laughs) And then something as powerful as alcohol came into this alcoholic's body, and let me tell you what, it's not fantasy and it's not delusion. You put a couple of drinks in me at age 17, I am funnier. I am stronger. I am more confident. I am less afraid. And you know what? I am better looking, damn it. And I am more of what I ever hoped and suspected I could be. And I don't understand. At 17, my first drunk, I fall in love with the effect produced by alcohol. Which is in a word for me, it's freedom. And it's freedom from what swirls around in my head in a sober state. And I don't make a decision at 17, I'm going to burn my life to the ground and hurt everyone that has the misfortune of caring about a loser like me until I end up in Alcoholics Anonymous. It's primal. It's almost molecular. I just have this sense, this feeling that alcohol's good and not drinking's bad. (laughs) And we're going to be doing more of this. And you know the rest of the story. You know, I go through the stages of alcoholism. Drinking no trouble. Drinking with trouble. Drinking all trouble. Until it's all trouble all the time. And I can't seem to get those moments of the past where I could step out easy and I liked the effect produced by alcohol and I felt free. I can't even get that. When did the bait and switch come in? When did it stop working? When did I have to go to oblivion to get any relief? And I got self-knowledge at 25 and didn't make it to Alcoholics Anonymous to age 31. And self-knowledge for an alcoholic of my type feels like a solution. Because it's not mom or dad or the court system or your employer or your girlfriend telling you you got a problem with booze. Self-knowledge is delivered in our mind and our voice with that screaming that you're going to die if you don't do something about your drinking. And I got that and it felt powerful. I knew I was never going to drink again, yet two weeks later after my own program of recovery, which entails telling everybody I quit drinking so don't try to tempt me, telling those lies, yeah, I feel great, I'm back in the gym, I'm working out again, everything's going great at work, and I look good on the outside. The laundry starts getting done, I start showing up to work five days a week, you know what I mean? The stuff that they can see starts looking better. But inside here where my soul lives, with every day since my last drunk, I'm getting more what? Irritable, restless, and discontent. Doctor's opinion in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. The biggest understatement in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, right? (laughs) And I drink again. And I spent six years trying to stop drinking. Pull the geographic, move to Boston, right? Find out they drink in Boston, you know? (laughs) I'm in Boston for three years till I well up my welcome, man. I come back to L.A., and three days later, I get the best job I've ever had in my life. And I don't mean why I was drinking. To this day, it may be the best job I've ever had, but I'm an alcoholic, right? I'm like a cat flung outside a second-story window. And I will land on my feet, boom, in a three-piece suit and a job interview, you know? And, a, <laughs> and I'll get the job. I can get the job, get the girl, get the money. I just can't keep any of it, right? We're just, we're great getters. We're lousy keepers. And I burned my life to the ground. 
and I have various vain attempts to control and enjoy my drinking. Brief periods of recovery followed always by a still worse relapse. A feeling like I was regaining control to find out I had lost still more control. I'm out there living chapter 3 and I don't even know it. I think I have a decision in the game. I don't understand I've lost the power of choice where drink's concerned. And I end up at my sister's house because I burned my life to the ground one more time, lost one more job, threw away one more opportunity. Can I come stay at your house and get on my feet? She says, you can stay in my house, but if you drink, you're out of my house. And I drank every day in that house for seven months before I came to AA. And if you don't know how you do that when they're watching you, maybe you're not a sneaky rat like I am. I got, a, I got no problem drinking around your schedule, you know what I mean? I'm unemployed. <laughs> what time do you go to work in the morning? 7 a.m., bars open. And we're way past drinking to kid ourselves we're better looking or to have courage to ask that pretty girl to dance, man. We're doing oblivion drinking. Let's get the whiskey on board hard enough and fast enough to shut off the head so we can pass out in the room or mooching off of our family to come to to face the hideous four horsemen. Terror, frustration, bewilderment, despair. And that morning interview with that hangover mind, who are you going to hurt today, Don? Who are you going to rip off today? Boy, you've taken every good thing that's ever come your way and you've torn it to shreds. How's it going to end for a guy like you? And that's my life, and I see no way out, and there's no safe direction, and I know I'm going to end drunk, and it's just a matter of time. And I have surrendered. And it's not the surrender we suggest our new, ma- our new friends make in Alcoholics Anonymous. It's the surrender many of us make while we're out there drinking. The surrender of a desperate man who no longer has the will to do battle with King Alcohol one more time. Who am I kidding? I'm never going to get sober. And that's the state I arrived in Alcoholics Anonymous in. Nothing new the weekend before I came to AA. Very typical. Got an unemployment check. Borrowed the family car to go cash it. Went on a three-day run. Showed back up at the house. It's been devastated by the disease of alcoholism because I don't suffer well and I don't suffer alone. And I take people with me on this hellish journey. I walk into that house to find out that an argument broke out in my absence where my brother-in-law wanted to report the car stolen. My sister negotiated him down to a missing persons report. (laughs) My sister has called the police. They are on their way to do the follow-up work. I start yelling at my sister because I'm a victim. I got warrants for my arrest. I'm going to jail. Thanks for nothing because now it's her fault. I go outside to wait for the police. I don't know what I'm going to be saying. I know I'm going to be lying, though. The black and white rolls up the street. On the side of the black and white, it says canine unit. Beautiful. They brought the dog. <laughs> like I'm in any shape to make a run for it. Cop gets out, starts asking me those hard, tough questions that trained professionals will ask you, like, where were you? And uh, everything I remember is illegal, so I'm lying. He knows I'm lying. It's uncomfortable when you're lying and they know you're lying. I want to divert his attention. I point to the dog in the back seat. Is that your partner? Yes, it is. Walks over, opens the door. Dog gets out. German Shepherd. Not a hair out of place. Like a Rin Tin Tin reincarnate. And with no, no prompting on my part, he started telling me the dog's story. The dog's past mandatory retirement. We can't retire him. He's too damn good. The dog's participated in more arrests than any dog in the history of Ventura County. The dog has participated in more arrests and rescues than any dog in the history of Ventura or Los Angeles County. This dog was so phenomenal that the officers took a collection out of pocket to send him over to Europe for international competition where he kicked butt on German, German shepherds, right? I say to the cop, that's a phenomenal dog you have there. Thought flies in the back of my mind. I know it's the truth. I want to deny it, but I know it's the truth. The truth is this dog has done significantly more with his life than I've done with mine. I hate the dog now. I did not know that was going to be my entrance into Alcoholics Anonymous because I walked back into a house devastated by the disease of alcoholism. They want me gone, which was appropriate. But I'm an alcoholic, and I'm not too proud to beg. 
Waterworks, Academy Award performance. I'll die out there. I got nowhere to go. You got to give me a chance. I'll go to AA and everything. I have no idea why I said that to this very moment. I think it was an over demonstration. Is it odd or is it God? My family didn't believe I was going to go to AA. My first week in AA, my sister drove me to AA and drove me back from AA. You know how that makes you feel when you look the way I look and you get in your older sister's car at the end of an evening of Alcoholics Anonymous? She's driving you home to her home, her 31-year-old loser brother. So, Donald, (laughs) what'd you learn in AA tonight? You know. (laughs) I don't remember my first night in Alcoholics Anonymous. It's reported I was there and somewhat entertaining. I do remember my second night because I hit the lottery. There's a lottery in Alcoholics Anonymous, and my prayer for you, if you're new, is that you hit it in some fashion that I did. I went to the 6 o'clock meeting at the Simi Valley Alano Club, and after the meeting, which ended at 7.30, I got my back against the wall, and I did not look that evening the way I look today. I got hair down the middle of my back, and it's filthy. I don't shower anymore. I'm wearing my sunglasses at night because I don't want you to see my eyes. I got my arms folded on my chest. And I'm rocking back and forth looking at you like this. I got my tough guy radar out. And I'm not folding and rocking like this because I'm a tough guy. It's because I'm coming up on 48 hours without a drink of alcohol. I'm physically addicted. And every molecule in my body is screaming in unison for a drink. Let's get a drink. Let's get a drink. In the book, Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous says the main problem of the alcoholic resides mainly in his mind rather than his body. My mind starts talking to me. Look at them, Don. They're clean and they're happy. They don't want you here. They're not even talking to you. Because everybody's giving me a wide berth at the Simi Valley Alano Club because I am dangerous. Because I'm terrified. And anybody terrified is dangerous. And my head starts talking to me. Why do you do this to us? Oh, you're going to quit drinking? It's going to be different because you're an AA. You know you're going to drink again, Don. We know you're going to drink again. You always drink again. What do you do? You take the pain. You take the pain. You take the pain. And then you go drink anyway. Here's an idea, Scooter. Why don't you bypass the pain? Let's get out of this joint. Let's go get drunk. And I'm going to leave Alcoholics Anonymous on my second night of recovery. And I'm going to go get drunk. And it's going to cost me everything. It's going to cost me the love of the last relative that will have anything to do with me. It's going to cost me my place of residence. And more than likely, it's going to cost me my life. Let me tell you what. Small price to pay if you can make the madness in my head stop for a couple hours. And I know that because I've always been willing to pay that price. And I caught a break. Because over in the corner that night were two good members of Alcoholics Anonymous named Lou and Mark. And it's the most important moment of my life. Whether I live or die is about to be decided in the next few minutes. But for Lou and Mark, it was Tuesday. (laughs) And Lou and Mark were where they were every Tuesday night between the 6 o'clock and the 8 o'clock meeting at the Simi Valley Alano Club. They hung out together and drank that AA coffee. They told those AA war stories. And more importantly, they had their eyes trained on the room and their eyes trained on the door, and they were looking for men to 12-step. And the way they tell the story is they saw me. And Lou looked at Mark and went, Whoa. (laughs) And Mark looked at Lou and went, "Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. And then I believe they took the most important action we'll ever have the honor and privilege of taking in a room of Alcoholics Anonymous. These two good men took a 30-foot journey across a clubhouse to cordially welcome a man to Alcoholics Anonymous who was dying from the disease of alcoholism. And he did it in the kind, unassuming way that we're taught to do it. Hi, I'm Lou. This is Mark. We don't think we've met you. Why don't you come sit with us? I'm here to tell you that stuff saves lives. And why do I think it's so important? 30 feet for Lou and Mark. For me, it's a million miles. Don't you know where I've been, what I've done, who I've hurt? Don't you understand? I can't get my eyes off of my shoes. You expect me to work the room. You expect me to introduce myself. You expect me to shake hands. Well, you better have packed the lunch because you've got a long wait. You see, Mark and Lou understood the terms of engagement for recovery from alcoholism that they would have to carry the message to the alcoholic that still suffers. 
And they sat me down. And Mark sat next to me. And Lou continued to stand. And he clapped me right in the middle of the back. He said, Don, this is Mark. He's going to be your sponsor. And he walked away. (laughs) And in that moment, my life changed. And I didn't know it. If you had come to me and said, you just had the most important moment of your life just occur, I would have said, what happened? I missed it, you know? But here's what happened. I got an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous as a sponsor, which means what? I'll be active if I'm willing to have it. Because he's active, he has commitments at AA at every meeting he attends, which means what? I'll have commitments. He's in the literature working the steps currently in his life, which means what? I'm in the literature working the steps if I'm willing to have it. He has a million friends. I didn't know that when you get a sponsor in Alcoholics Anonymous, you inherit all their friends. Now, I want to be clear that when you're new, this does not feel like an asset. (laughs) What it feels like is there's a bunch of strangers up in your business like, why... Why are you so interested in me? Why am I so fascinating to you people? And the people you don't know just roll up on you with those syrupy, sweet smiles. And they're like, I'm expecting a miracle. And, you, and you're thinking, you should be expecting a head wound. Back off, you know. And you go, <laughs> so I got a sponsor. I got a home group. I'm in the literature. I got commitments. I got friends and fellowship. In an instant, all the spiritual tools of Alcoholics Anonymous are laid at my feet, and my job is to pick them up. Now, here's where it's tricky. I don't know how to use any of them. Now, I'll tell you what. I joke about getting into construction when I was new in sobriety, and I had a nickname, The Bleeder. It's all true. I didn't know which end to hold a hammer. Yet, if you come to my house right now, I'll open my garage, and what you'll see in my garage is this. Beautiful workbenches built in a U-shape around the garage. Hanging pegboard systems with every tool you know that has a specific place it goes. Trust me, I tell my wife all the time. (laughs) Every power tool known to man in storage underneath. I got table saws and tile saws and reciprocating saws. I got saws to cut saws. You know what I mean? He got all that. And you'd think to yourself, wait a minute, you were, you were the bleeder. You don't know how to work with your hands. How did, let me tell you, it's the same way the spiritual tools and Alcoholics Anonymous works, right? So when I'm new and I get into like working with my hands, repetition breeds familiarity. Familiarity breeds comfort. And today, if I get a new tool, I bring it in. What do I do? I open the tool. Right on the top are the instructions. I leave the tool in the garage. I go inside. I sit down with a cup of coffee. I read every word in the instruction manual. And at the end of that, I think I got an idea what they're trying to tell me. I think I got an idea. I got a pretty good idea. I think I know what they mean. Do I start working with the tool? No. I call up one of my buddies who's had that tool for years, and I go, listen, this is what I just bought. You know how to work that thing, right? He goes, yeah, I got one of that one for years. Would you come over and line me out on it? Absolutely. He comes over, helps me set up the tool, shows me how it works, shows me how not to cut off something of my body, right? (laughs) And then what do I do? Practice, practice, practice. Repetition breeds familiarity, breeds comfort. I do the same thing with the steps with my sponsor. I don't know how to use the spiritual tools. Spiritual tools become spiritual weapons in the hands of the uninformed. So I get a sponsor, but I read the directions, right? I become proficient, right? I'm 90 days sober. I come to AA, and I used to say this, read the book, read the book, read the book. By the time I'm 90 days sober, they're like going, stop reading the book, stop reading the book, stop reading the book. (laughs) I'm 90 days sober. I'm that guy, right? I'm quoting the book every time I share, and I'm quoting, but I'm driving the old timers crazy. Not my sponsor. People come up to me and go, You could teach a parrot to talk. People come up to me and go, Well, you can quote it. Let's see if you can live it. And they're hurting my feelings. My sponsor pulled me aside. I go, Don't listen to him. Because you're doing great. You keep reading that book. I'll tell you when you're not doing good. Thank God he didn't piss on my enthusiasm. You know what he did? He fanned that flame. He fanned that flame. And he took me through all three sides of the triangle simultaneously, unity, service, and recovery, without ever telling me he was doing that. Isn't that something? He just told me what we're doing next. What are we doing next? 
And then we do what was next. And he taught me how to be an AA member. You see, he didn't just take me through the steps and get me this new life. This was not some kind of self-help program. This isn't Tony Robbins. This isn't the find the inner dawn. This isn't self-help. This is yourself sucks, right? You see, my sponsor believed that an alcoholic would rather see a beautiful sunset than listen to the world's greatest sermon. And he was a beautiful sunset. And all my sponsors have been men of action and beautiful sunsets. What they do has spoken so loudly, I haven't had to listen to what they say. I have been able to follow their example. They live by the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous. So having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and practice these principles in all their affairs. You ever been to a literature study? You ever been to a discussion meeting? They go, what are the principles? Oh my God, let's get confusing. The principles are the steps. I'm going to practice these principles, these steps, in all my affairs. Bill gave us a clue when he wrote in the 12 and 12. The 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous are principles, spiritual in nature, when practiced as a way of life, will dispel the need to drink alcohol and leave the sufferer happily and usefully whole. I'm going to be of some earthly good if I learn how to bring the steps into my life. That's what it's telling me. But I'm a mess when I get here. I don't know how to live. I'm not housebroken. (laughs) I'm a street guy. And I find out because I have a sponsor that loves me. And I, man, it took me years to realize that he didn't yell at me. I used to think my first sponsor yelled at me every day. I found out what he did was he told me the truth calmly, and it felt like a hurricane wind coming through me. Because mostly he pointed out how I was wrong about things. Remember how painful that was when you were new? That's okay, Don, you're just wrong. Wrong? I can't be wrong. I can't be wrong. (laughs) Lay awake at night, he's crazy, I'm not wrong. (laughs) You got to be here a while and work the steps until suddenly you have that epiphany like change is impossible unless I'm first wrong about something I thought I was right about. It is the constant ingredient in change. Now, when I'm wrong, I'm not thrilled, but I go, well, I guess it's time to change. Or I get to evolve. I don't have to be that guy anymore. I was just wrong about something. My my sponsors are the ones that taught me that. But I'm not housebroken. I mean, it was embarrassing because let me tell you, there's an unwritten set of rules about Alcoholics Anonymous that's not in any conference-approved literature that seems to be handed down from old-timer to old-timer to old-timer over the years. And so I would go to meetings and My sponsor's job was to let me know what grievous infraction I had committed that evening. My first 30, 60, 90 days, I'd go to a meeting, be on my best behavior. I'm honest. I'm trying. End of the meeting. More often than not, I'd see my sponsor. He'd catch my eye. He'd give me that crooked finger. Come here, Don. And I I think to myself, now what did I do? And I found out there's things we don't do in A. He'd say, Don, if you're bored in a meeting, you can't go in the corner and do push-ups. Don. You can't get up and get coffee six times during the meeting. You're disturbing everybody. Don, if you don't like what an old-timer says to you, you can't threaten to snatch the life out of him and make amends later. Don. But I don't know, man. It's dog rules in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know? You don't, you know, it's like a dog. Dog doesn't know he's doing anything wrong until you tell him. It's dog rules. Listen, I got a dog. Bo the Wonder Dog. I love this guy. He's the apple of my eyes. 12 years old. He is a gentleman. You spend five minutes with my dog, you'll fall in love with my dog. Trust me. But Bo, like any dog you can think of at one time, was a puppy. I remember when we got Bo, and I one, we had him about three weeks, man. And I'm on the phone with a sponsee one night, and Bo comes into my line of sight. And, just, and I remember thinking, oh, there's Bo. Oh, he's so cute. I love that little guy. And then he went into a crouch, right? And I was like... And involuntarily, I went, oh, no. And, uh, <laughs> and my sponsee goes, what is it? I go, oh, Bo's taking a dump in the living room. <laughs> and he goes, do you have to go? I go, oh, no, you can't interrupt him. You go traumatize the little guy. 
I go, that's, that's not how you potty train a dog, man. You got to kind of stock him, kind of keep an eye on him, right? And when he looks like he's about to break bad, you got to scoop him up and take him outside. It will freak him out a little bit because he'll be like, I'm in the air, I'm in the air, I'm in the air. And, and you'll drop him on the lawn outside and he'll look at you with this innocence and he'll say, what the hell was that about, man? And you're staring at him, he's staring at you, and hopefully he'll go, well, I'm outside Kind of got to go to the bathroom. And if he does, if he takes a poop, you better throw a party. You're able. Who's a good boy? And he'll get all excited. He'll go, oh, man, I didn't know. You want me to poop out here? I could totally do that. I love you. My sponsor did exactly the same thing with me in Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> He'd see me set up a meeting, good job. Put out literature, good job. Clean coffee pots, good job. He never missed an opportunity to let me know I was doing something right in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'll tell you what, man, we all have that shared experience, you know? We watch people crawl out of the bushes. This guy crawled out of the bushes in my home group a while back. Home group's the SOS men's group. We meet on Monday and Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock in Bellingham, Washington on 14th Street in the Fairhaven District of Bellingham, Washington, man. And it's a men's group, right? Where men are men, and the mental illness is not accurately measurable, you know? And the... <laughs> but we're a third legacy group, man, and we got strong sponsorship and active service, and we carry the message to many, many different places, and we are organized, and we move as one, and we love Alcoholics Anonymous, and these young guys are doing great. We had this young guy, Jimmy, come into our meeting, man. He crawled in from the bushes. You know, he's speaking in tongues. He can't sit still during the meeting. He looks bad. He smells bad. The elevator ain't going to the top floor with Jimmy, right? Two weeks later, I show up to the meeting. Jimmy's in the back making coffee. It's no less than a miracle. I grabbed the nearest guy to, to me, home group. Man, I go, Jimmy's making coffee. <laughs> it's a miracle. I'm not drinking the coffee tonight, but Jimmy's making coffee, you know. And, <laughs> and it's all you can do not to roll up on Jimmy and go, who's a good alcoholic? You're a good alcoholic. <laughs> yes, you are, <laughs> you know. Now, we're cooler than that. We roll up and go, hey, man, I saw you making the coffee. Thanks, brother. I really appreciate it. Good job. And we say that because it was said to us, and we know what it's like in the dead of the night. We can't sleep. We got nothing but those memories of guilt, shame, and remorse. But we also got those AA memories that we're developing as we're new. Somebody saw me. You see, what we use is the ancient spiritual invitation Right? The spiritual principle of invitation. That's how we save lives around here. We don't dominate. We're shoulder to shoulder, common journey. What we do is we set the banquet table and we invite our new friends to eat with us. Right? My sponsor used that ancient spiritual principle of the invitation. He'd roll up on me. And the thing about invitation is so important is it leaves the sufferer with a little bit of self-esteem of the right kind and a little bit of dignity. Right? My sponsor would go, hey, i got to set up a meeting tomorrow night. I could really use your help. And at the low point of my existence, somebody asked me for help in Alcoholics Anonymous. I couldn't believe it. Absolutely. And I'd show up. We'd set some, some little podunk meeting. And he'd shake my hand. He'd go, thanks, man. I really appreciate it. I want to be clear. I've been some places. I accomplished some things before Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't know why. That meant more to me than all of it. He'd roll up on me and go, hey, they're forming an ad hoc committee to kind of study the problems we're having carrying the message and corrections. You strike me as a pretty smart fella. <laughs> <laughs> Play the ego card, you know. And, uh, <laughs> we'd really love your input. And I'd think, well, because I got to AA just in the nick of time. And, uh, <laughs> but alcoholism is a disease of separation and isolation. Separation and isolation. And I don't know about you, in a vision for you, it describes it perfectly. The less people tolerated us, the more we withdrew from them, from life itself. It's a chilling vapor that's lulling and settled down, it ever becoming ever blacker, right? I'm that guy. I'm done with humanity because humanity's done with me. I could be in a room of a thousand people and I felt invisible. I felt 
that by the time I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I had dematerialized, that nobody could see me. And then you invited me. You invited me to do service in AA. You invited me out for coffee. You invited me out to the coffee shop after the meeting. And when the waitress came by and said, what do you have? And I got no money in my pocket. I said, nothing. I'm good. I'm not hungry. And I can hear my stomach grumbling. And the men of Alcoholics Anonymous saw that. And I find a plate and sausage and hash browns in front of me 10 minutes later. And I say, I didn't order that. She smiles sweetly and says, don't worry about it, sweetie. Somebody did. Just eat it. And I look at the guy next to me and he goes, good advice. Just eat it. And you take those actions and you include me. You invite me in your car. You invite me in your homes. You invite me to your stupid birthday parties with your kids that I don't even know. And I don't know why I'm there until I find myself laughing with your kids. You brought me into your families. You brought me into your homes. You brought me into your means. You brought me into the center of alcoholics. And honestly, you never failed to invite me because you had read the big book. You would hide the psychic change. You read the part that said the realm of the spirit is broad, roomy, and inclusive, never exclusive. We believe it's available to all men. You believe that AA is run by God. You believe this is the realm of the spirit. You believe that it must always be inclusive to everybody. So you invited me at my lowest. You invited me at my stinkiest. You invited me at my most psychotic. You invited me at my most violent. You invited me when I hated myself and I hated you. You invited me with a smile on your face and you included me and what it made me feel and what it left me with was a thought that maybe I'm wrong right it means so much when you're new maybe I'm wrong maybe it's not over yet maybe there's a little strength left in me yet and you encourage me my sponsor takes me through the steps And we do it quickly, man. By the time I'm five months sober, I'm deep into my amends. I'm I'm praying and meditating, but I don't know what I'm doing. I'm I'm trying to do a 10-step, but most of that involves going to my sponsor and telling them what I did and how do I clean it up. You know what I mean? But I'm doing it. Because the steps aren't one and done. We don't grade it here. The steps aren't built in an ascent. The steps are built in the affinity symbol. They go on and on and on. And when you're new, they feel so compartmentalized, don't they? You can go to any good newcomer and go, what step are you on? Step three, sir. What step are you on? Step nine, I'm about to do an amends. Somebody spot me. Oh, it's a bad amends. Ah, oh. ah, oh. oh, that hurts. It's such a spiritual burn, you know. But as we stay in the process of the steps, that affinity pattern, right, what happens? The loving hand of God comes down. And it feels like he pulls the compartments that we superimpose, separating the steps. And what's left is what the book refers to in three places as design for living. My most important description of that, design for living that works in rough going. So now I'm an AA member, right? I work the steps, I get the, I get the prize. What's the prize? Spiritual awakening. The thing that felt so valueless to me when I start the process now turns out to be the keys of the kingdom. Because by then, I'm accomplishing the miraculous. Right? That's what it feels like. What are you doing, Don? Did you start a Fortune 500 company, go back to school, become a lawyer? No, no, no. I, I'm five months sober. I'm five and a half months sober, and I haven't had a sip of whiskey. I'm a daily drinker. I've been trying to quit drinking for six years, everything I think of, and the harder I try, the worse it gets. I do better when I don't try to be good. And I haven't drank in five and a half months. No more evidence of the presence of a loving God do I need because I am a bird that doesn't fly. I'm a fish that doesn't swim. I'm a drunk that doesn't drink. I'm living in an unnatural state, and somehow I'm able to breathe in and out. Yeah, I'm having tough days. Yeah, it's not easy. Yeah, I don't sleep that good at night. But my sponsor told me, he goes, look, buddy, we know you. You took a long, long, dangerous walk into some dark, dark, dangerous woods. But here's the difference. You walked in alone, but you're walking out with us. And we're Alcoholics Anonymous, and we know the way out. So take our hand and hold on tight, because we lose a lot of them on the way out of the woods, and we don't want to lose you. But we bet your bottom dollar, we know the way out. But it's a long walk out of those woods. 
And there's a lot of amends you got to make, and there's a lot of change you got to go through, and a lot of delusions that have to be smashed, and a lot of self-delusions that have to be smashed. And it's painful growing up in Alcoholics Anonymous in your 30s. Go talk to Sharon. She knew me when I was barely two years sober. You, I was trying. <laughs> I'm trying. Sharon would just get that look like, oh my God, he really thinks he's doing well. You know, I just like. <laughs> God, I remember being four years sober, and I'm at the big Wednesday night meeting, and Sharon, a beautiful Sharon, beautiful smile. Don, do you have a minute? Step into my office and took me down the row where she was sitting and nobody was there and told me in no uncertain terms what I did that was wrong, and I heard it, and I wasn't offended. I thought, she is like an icon in this group, and she cares enough about me to let me know I did something wrong. Love is not, I'll tell you what, you know, I'll co-sign your BS, you co-sign mine, maybe we can walk a little ways. <laughs> that ain't love in AA. This is love. You tell your buddy something, he goes, well, you got 24 hours to tell your sponsor or I'm telling him. That BS that we think we live in the streets, man, don't snitch, don't tell anybody. I've, I've seen everybody roll over on everybody when they get a chance to save their own hide. <laughs> Only in AA have I seen the kind of love that sponsorship illustrates, and one AA has for another AA, where I love you more and care more about your life that I'm willing to risk your wrath rather than see you die. Because the game we play around here is you bet your life. I'm six months sober. I go on a 12-step call. And, uh, and I'm lucky, man. I'm one of the guys that we had active 12-step work when I got sober. A lot of people have never been to a real 12-step call. And, and, and I don't think we've lost our 12-step legacy. I just think geographically it's changed. We need to remember that. You know, because we're not a secret society anymore, there's a conveyor belt to the front door of our home groups. And sometimes we forget that's where our 12-step work needs to happen, in our home groups. But we used to go out into people's homes, and we got a call on the 12-step line, and me and another guy with six months and a guy with 14 years, because never go alone, we went to go carry the message. And there's a guy in there named Donnie drinking Jack Daniels that night. And we're trying to carry the message. And the uh, other guy with six months hit him with his six-month stuff, you know, which was good. Then the guy with 14 years hit him with his 14-year stuff, which was amazing. And then I hit him with my six-month stuff, which at the time sounded like this. Well, I'm six months sober. I haven't had a drink in six months. Uh, I still live in my sister's house. Uh, I work construction. I absolutely hate it. Uh, I don't have a car. I'm hopelessly in debt. Uh, I have a tyrannical figure in my life I call a sponsor. I'm pretty sure I don't like him, and I know he doesn't like me. Uh, if you want what I have and you're willing to go to any length to get it, And we leave, we leave, and Donnie's still drinking, and I think it's a failed 12-step call, you know? But I'd been taught, like, if you're not drinking, it's always a success, right? I get off of that job I bleed at every day the next day. I'm at my sister's house getting ready for the meeting. The phone rings, and it's Donnie. Couldn't believe it. He was drunk as Cooter Brown the night before. And he says, hey, man, where's that meeting tonight? So I give him directions to the meeting, and I ask Donnie, do we need to come pick you up? And he says, no, I got a car. And I thought, damn, he's doing better than I am. And... Uh, <laughs> So now i got to rush down to the meeting so I can beat Donnie to the meeting, you know, because I've been taught to do that. And uh, He shows up, and I do what we do. I introduce him to everybody. I get him a half a cup of coffee. We're sitting down talking, and Donnie says, hey, man, that stuff you said last night about sponsorship, which I didn't even remember saying, he goes, it makes sense to me. Would you be willing to sponsor me? I said, I'll get right back to you. <laughs> and I jump up, man, and I run through the meeting, and I find my sponsor. I go, you know that 12-step call last night? He goes, yeah. I go, the guy's here. He goes, oh, that's great. I go, yeah, he asked me to sponsor him. He goes, that's beautiful. What, what did you say? Well, I told him I'd get right back to him. His whole face changed. He goes, let me get this straight. He's drunk last night. Yeah. And somehow he made it to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh-huh. And he took whatever strength he had left and asked you for help. <laughs> yeah. And you told him you'd get back to him? <laughs> yeah. He goes, go say yes, you selfish bastard. And, uh, 
and he spins on his heels and he walks away. And that's the way he used to end conversations. I would just see his bald head going off in the distance. <laughs> and so I yelled at his bald head. I go, dude, I'm six months sober. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't want to kill him. He doesn't even turn around. He just waves me off and he says, ah, you got to kill a couple before you get the hang of it. And <laughs> Alcoholics Anonymous, we care. No, we don't. No, we don't. So now I'm sponsoring this guy, and I find out I know how to sponsor. I find out it's monkey see, monkey do, right? I'm just telling this guy what my sponsor told me. That's all AA is, monkey see, monkey do, but you better pick the right monkeys, right? And I've been surrounded by great monkeys, so I'm telling Donnie what to do. And, you know, because they told me, now I'm just passing it on. That's all it is. We're going to meetings, and I'm, you know, I'm six months sober. I go to meetings every night. So he goes to meetings with his sponsor every night. And we're going to every kind of meeting, speaker meetings, literature meetings, big book studies. And I notice that the big book studies where you're supposed to read, when it's Donnie's turn to read, he always passes. We don't do that in AA. You participate, right? Ah, you got to tell Donnie what my sponsor would tell me. So I pull him aside after the meeting. And I go, Donnie, when it's your turn to read, you got to read, man. We participate in our own recovery. He gets all sheepish. He looks at his shoes, all embarrassed. He goes, listen, man, here's the thing. I don't read so good. Fact is, I barely read at all. Man, you made a mistake like that in polite society. Wouldn't you be embarrassed? But we're in AA. That stuff don't embarrass you. What came out of my mouth was intuitive. I just said it out. I said, Donnie, this is no big deal. I know how to read. So for the next six months, we go to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. At the end of the night, Donnie would take me home. Why? He had the car, right? <laughs> And we'd sit in, my sister, in front of my sister's house under the street light, and we'd read the big book back and forth. And, you know, when he didn't know a word, I'd pronounce the word for him. I'd, we'd look up stuff. And, and Donnie learned to read, reading the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'll tell you, if you hear him read, if you heard him read in a meeting, you wouldn't think he went to Yale, okay? But you wouldn't know that he came here with that impediment because there's no waste in God's economy. God runs AA. He knows exactly who's supposed... Everybody here is uniquely qualified to carry the message to the alcoholic that still suffers. God is sending people to you. Your job is simply to say yes. And I, I was taught that in AA, and I get it, man. I've, I've had people standing in front of me sometimes asking for help, and this is what I'm thinking to myself. This one too, God? This one? Because I don't see it. But I've learned to say yes, and then I always find out later there's no mistakes in God's world. He puts the people with the people that are supposed to be there. So I start sponsoring people at six months sober, and I've never been without sponsees. 31 years sober, never been without sponsees. And if I had to pick one reason, and there's a million things that we get to do in AA, that we have honor and privilege that accentuate our sobriety, strengthen our sobriety, help us grow into the God's kids that God wants us to be, all those things. But if I had to pick one that I'd hang my hat on that's helped me the most, I'd say it's sponsoring people. It's something you absolutely don't want to miss, right? That's what the book says. And it's been wonderful. And it's been both sides of the coin. I've always been sponsored. I've always sponsored men. I'll tell you, this was my favorite little story about sponsorship. This is why I think it's so important. I was 10 years sober, and I got sick. And uh, they couldn't diagnose it properly, and it was getting worse, and they're trying different medication, and it's getting worse. And I'm not sick for a week or a month. I'm sick for a year, right? Right? And uh, at the end of that year, i got to tell you, I'm feeling pretty sorry for myself. And my wife's getting kind of tired of being married to the sick guy. And it's really inconvenient. And they put me on this experimental medication. They said, this is either going to work great or all hell's going to break loose. Monday morning, I take the medication for the first time. All hell breaks loose. I'm only at work for 20 minutes, and i got to go home. I'm in the worst pain I've ever been in. I'm laying in bed in the fetal position, wearing a parka because I'm so cold. Then I'd be so hot, sweat's flying off my body, literally, and now I've got no clothes on, I'm vacillating back and forth, and this is punctuated by well-timed or mistimed attempts to get to the bathroom in time. And I am full of self-pity. The self-pity is dripping down the walls, and I'm pissed at God. Because I'm 10 years sober, and I've done everything he's asked me to do, and this isn't supposed to happen to me. How dare you? And me and God, we're not on speaking terms. And I mean, I just, oh, I just hate everything. And then the phone rings. And I look down at the caller ID, and it's a guy I sponsored. I'm thinking, oh, no, not now, not now. <laughs> but I got good training in Alcoholics Anonymous, man, so I answer the phone. He goes, how you doing, sponsor? Because everyone knows I'm sick. 
And usually in those situations, I lie, right? I go, well, I'm having a tough day, but with God and AA, I'll be okay. But for whatever reason, that day, I didn't have it in me, man. I let it fly. I said, how am I doing? How am I feeling? Let me tell you, I'm in the worst pain I've ever been in my life. And they can't figure out what's wrong with me. And you know what? I got a sneaking suspicion I'm going to die. And guess what? I don't want to die. And the marriage? Oh, yeah, she's getting a little tired of being married to the sick guy. And I don't know what I did to piss off God, but I am over God. We are not on speaking terms. And the self-pity? It's dripping down the walls of my bedroom right now. I feel so sorry for myself. I hate how sorry for myself I feel. You want to know how I'm doing? That's how I'm doing. It's dead quiet for a couple of seconds. And he says this. Oh, my God, Spons. I am so sorry to hear that. But listen, I met this girl. I had to cover the phone. I was laughing so hard. And I got the joke. And I got the joke. And it snapped me out of my self-pity. And I got to tell you, man... That's a turning point for a guy like me. I, re- I don't know, man. I'd been sober long enough that God had to hit me over the head with that experience. I recognized the value. I got it. I'd always heard old-timers say, my sponsees do more for me than I do for them. And I think, man, that's not my experience. <laughs> Ten years, I got it. I got it. And, man, I count on it today. I can't tell you. Man, I, you know, I'm out there in the real world with a real job slaying dragons, right? And I've got, you know, people talk about how do you bring prayer meditation into your daily living. I don't have to worry about that crap. I just sponsor a lot of people, right? Because they don't care. It's like baby bird, baby bird. Feed me, feed me. They don't care, right? My phone rings all day long, man. And you know what it is? It's a built-in vacation from self. Because I'm thinking about the deal and what i got to do when I'm going to say to this guy, the phone rings, boom, talk to me about what's going on. We're in spiritual solution. I have to be some kind of example that this program works. And you make me better. You make me a better version of me because I sponsor. I've always been willing to let myself down, but I'm not going to let the other guy down. We all have that build in us. We're built to give. What if it's true? What if we misinterpreted who we are? What if we come in here and we think, what if the selfish, self-centered isn't, is a unnatural state for us to exist in. What if because of our selfishness and self-centeredness, what if that unnatural existence is what caused all the pain? What if we're built for service? How would you find out if you're built for service? You would serve and pay attention to how it made you feel. To this day, you want to know when I feel the best? When I'm thinking about the other guy. And all you got to do is say yes. And the other guys keep coming. And those built-in vacations from self, or for those moments or moments, I'm not thinking about me. And for those moments or moments, I'm not thinking about me. And I'm simply trying to do what I think God would have me do and serve my fellow man. In those moments, my character defects are instantaneously removed. It doesn't mean they're not going to be waiting for me when I get off the phone. But I'll tell you what, every time I've broken bad, done something I wish I hadn't have done, done something I'm embarrassed about, done something I had to make amends for, every time, always, in that alchemy, what's present? State. What's absence? God. What brings me closer to God? What is the conduit? I can't get there without you. You see, God is a result of service for me. For me. I pray, I meditate, I've got a good ritual. That's not what brings me close to God. It's a result. I feel the nearness of my creator after I serve only. That's when I feel it. When I give a guy a ride home after a meeting, I don't want to give him a ride home. Why does this guy ask me? Don't you know who I am? You know how long I've been sober? There's all these other guys to ask. Where do you live? Oh, two counties over? Of course you do. Well, great, I'm going to take you home. I'm going to slow down and just kick you out at the halfway house because i got a real job and a real life, and i got to get up in the morning while you're eating cornflakes watching your 70-inch TV that the state paid for. That's my attitude. (laughs) I'm driving him home. I'm not going to talk to this guy. And you know what happens? God flies in the middle. He starts talking. I start talking. I start listening. He starts listening. Now I shut down the car. Now I'm not even leaving. Now he's not getting out. 45 minutes later, we're best friends. There's stuff coming out of my mouth I can't believe. 
do you have a ride to the meeting tomorrow night? You know, I'm just like. <laughs> he skips off into the halfway house. I don't even need the car to get home. I could just float home. <laughs> I did service in Alcoholics Anonymous based on spiritual inconvenience. And I'm thinking to myself, I wonder what the little people are doing tonight. Because <laughs> I'm living large in Alcoholics Anonymous. I've never needed sponsorship as much as I've needed it this year. I'll tell you two quick stories and I'll sit down. February of this year, my wife and I are in Maui for a 10-day vacation. I want to be very clear. We are not go-to-Maui vacation people. We're like maybe state park people. You know what I mean? <laughs> it was a big freaking deal for us to be there. And uh, man, we, you know, she's 67, I'm 62. We're old and wrinkled, married 26 years, a beautiful Eileen. I love her like good poetry. But that 10 days, man, we were teenagers. You know, we're in the surf together. We're eating mangoes on the beach, fish tacos at night, telling old stories, talking about how blessed we are. March, she has a little checkup at the doctor that you have when you're 67, a little procedure to see how everything's going. A couple weeks after that, man, I'm sitting in a doctor's office and you hear the stuff you don't want to hear when you love somebody the way I love Eileen. Tumor, well-defined Stage three rectal cancer. And in that moment, all your problems become Teflon coated and slide off of you. And you're left with only one. And I'm taught we don't pray for outcome. That's easy when you want a job promotion, when you hope your football team wins, when you hope things go your way. What about when it's the person you love more than anybody on the planet? You've had the longest relationship with anyone on the planet. What do you do then when you see the fear in her face? And you still got to go to the power, but you can't pray for outcome. And you got to tell them the truth. I'm scared to death, God, I'm scared to death. And I don't know what your will is for Eileen, and I don't know what your will is for me. But I want to thank you. And you shift to gratitude, because gratitude defeats our lower self. And that night, I prayed to God for a half an hour straight, and I went over everything he had done for me and Eileen over being together for 28 years, how he shepherded us through when I blew up our marriage at 11 years sober and seven years married, how all the fear, my heart attack five years, everything he had done for us, gratitude, gratitude, gratitude didn't want to focus on the scare of the moment and miss all the kindness and sweetness that we'd experienced in our life. And my wife went on a journey. And uh, I mean, I'm telling you, it's seven weeks of radiation, two rounds of chemo, and our whole world became that. I'd go to work every day, get her set up, be off work early enough to take her to her appointments because she felt comfortable with me taking her. And I would take our dog with us, and the cancer center we were going to was a beautiful facility and had this great pond and this huge grassy field attached to it, and it hadn't been open for very long. So it was never really busy. And I'd take Eileen in, and she'd check in, and she'd go in for a radiation treatment, and the dog and I would go take a walk. And me and Bo, the wonder dog, and God would talk while Eileen was in radiation. And we would thank him for our day, and we'd thank him for one more day together. And as it got worse and she got sicker and everything happened, we continued to stay in gratitude. And she's 90 days past the finish of her treatment. She had the big scans last week. And Tuesday, I'll be in the doctor's office with my wife. And Tuesday, we'll find out how she did. And I needed to be here this weekend, didn't I? I needed the distraction. My wife this weekend has been working with three brand new girls all weekend long. See, we know what to do. We know how to get out of self. We know how not to be obsessed. We know where the comfort is. And I never needed sponsorship both sides of the coin more during this period because my men would call and not one of them would ask how Eileen was doing. It was just like a script. They'd call up with their problems with their work and with their relationships and their marriages. And they'd call up and they'd ask me what to do. And maybe once in a while they go, oh, by the way, how's Eileen? I go, she's horrible. Thanks for asking. And uh, <laughs> and that's what I wanted, though. I didn't want to talk about it. I had enough people calling me wanting to talk about it. I, I didn't want to talk about it at a certain point. 
And what an opportunity to have these men come in and let me focus on service. But my sponsor, I called my sponsor every day. And I delivered via words my fear to my sponsor on a platter every day. And every day he picked the platter up and he accepted it. He took it every day. And he didn't pat me on the head and say, there, there, alcoholic, it's going to be okay. He said, I don't know what's going to happen, Don, but I know this. You love each other very much, and you've, it's been wonderful watching how you guys are in marriage. And he goes, I'd like to think that your work's not done, and I'd like to think her work's not done. And he'd say something like that, and then he'd go, by the way, Don, don't forget, I love you. And it would just give me that little bit of spark, and I called him every day, and he'd always close by telling me that he loved me. He'd ask what I was doing, how Eileen was doing, what am I doing. He'd make suggestions if I was coming up against something, what to do. And at the end, he would tell me he loved me. Isn't that something? He wanted to know, he wanted me to know I wasn't alone. And you know what? I wasn't. I had God, I had AA, and I had my sponsor. And so we walked through this. And Eileen and I have joked about it. I mean, at the end of the treatment, we met with the doctor, and she did so well in the treatment that they took the last week of radiation off. And, the, and she's very, you know... People who know my wife, she's very bright. And so she's sitting and listening to everything the doctor says, and he's just thrilled with the way things happen, letting her know in 90 days we'll do the big follow-up scans. And she's very composed and very calm, and then the doctor left the office. And she just burst into tears. And she reaches over, and she just grabs me with this great strength that I didn't think she had at that point. And she's, she's like, I love you so, so much. Thank you. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for being so kind and for being here every step of the way. I just don't know how to put in words how much I love you. And I said, oh, honey, that's just the drugs talking. (laughs) You'll get over it. (laughs) And she laughed. And that's my part in the equation of our marriage is I serve and I make her laugh, and that's what makes me valuable to her. So, I pretty much run out of time. I want to thank all the other speakers. I want to thank the committee, Dave and Dave Incorporated, for doing such a wonderful job here this weekend. And I want to close with just a thought. Why we've been in here this weekend, safe, sane, and sober, enjoying the good life that we have. They're out there on the streets, some of them with an earshot of what's going on here, and they are dying. And what's interesting about that is they are coming to Alcoholics Anonymous. They will be on that conveyor belt of misery that will arrive at our home groups. And the funny thing is they don't even know they're coming yet, but we know they are. And the question we have to ask ourselves as good members of Alcoholics Anonymous is when our new friends arrive, where will we be? And more importantly, how will we be? Am I going to be at my home group talking about fantasy football, my latest fishing trip, what I'm doing on holiday, money I'm making, latest biggest deal, the car I'm thinking about buying? Or am I going to leave all that stuff in the parking lot where it belongs and should never cross the threshold of a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous? Am I going to be like my examples, like Lou and Mark? with their eyes trained on the room and their eyes trained on the door looking for men to 12-step. See, I show up at Alcoholics Anonymous, and i got to be honest with you, it's just another night in an endless series of undeserved gifts, and I can miss what's really here. It may just be another Wednesday night or Tuesday night or Thursday night for me, but for somebody else, that could be the most important moment of their life, and I don't want to miss it. But I come to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I have no business going to AA some nights. i got the world hanging all over me my money problems, business problems, things I'm self-obsessed with. And I do the same thing for years. I shut off the truck and I don't get out. And I say the same prayer. God, I'm in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and the world's hanging all over me, but I'm going to leave my problems in the front seat of this truck and I know you'll take care of them. Give me eyes to see and a heart to feel. Let me remember what it was like to walk in when I was new. And then I get quiet and I just meditate on what it was like to be new in AA when I walked in so scared, not knowing what to do. And now I can go to AA, and now I can work the room and shake hands with everybody and look for that guy I don't know and introduce myself and try to reduce their feelings of difference the way you did it for me. It's important work that we have ahead of us, but it's the most noble thing that's ever been placed in my life, just being a member of Alcoholics Anonymous in rooms like this with people like you. Thanks for listening.
Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.